Hey guys, good morning. It is Wednesday and I'm making a video based on a comment I got from someone I would consider a believer, but in pretty serious error. Um, the weird thing is every video he makes is, um, it's supposed to be warnings and clarification on, you know, what not to believe in. For example, Lordship Salvation, Cal you know, certain Calvinist teachings, uh, you know, John Piper, Paul Washer, those types, you know, popular Christian channels. Like uh, he's doing a video on Melissa Doherty right now, um, who I think is a total heretic. Just a, a, someone who is a perfect example of what modern pop culture Christianity is like. She says things like, if you're not following Jesus's commands, uh, if there's not a change in your everyday life towards God, then you never believe to begin with. Or she'll say, you have to question yourself. Did you really believe the gospel? You know, heresies like that, dangerous heresies. Um, subtle enough for people who aren't learned to just scare themselves half to death with it, right? Um, so let me get to the comment here. Oh, oops. Uh, let's see. Okay, so it should be right here. No, I'm gonna come up here. Yes, here we go. So this, I'm gonna just go over, this was a series of comments. We went back and forth for several days. And, uh, you know, I'd like to make it pretty evident that I'm not hiding anything about what was said in this comment so i'm just going to put it up here on my screen so this this started with salvation being by grace through faith but the christian life is going back to the law now he's not wording it that way let me be abundantly clear that's why i'm putting the comment up because i don't want anything to be um taken out of context he's not using the verbiage okay guys you're saved by grace through faith now get back to the law but you'll see that that's going to be implied here. So let's just get through a big chunk of it real quick first, and then we'll go over it. Uh, denying yourself is denying yourself the pleasure of sin. Luke 14, is for Christians to live by. We should forsake all that we have. And the reason why he's saying that is because I had challenged him if he has done that right? Because there's a discipleship in John 15, and there's a discipleship in Luke 14. Um, in Luke 14, you can see Christ telling people that this is almost an impossible task, you know? Um, like when Peter said, you know, I'll follow you anywhere, Lord. And in John 13, 36, I think he says, you'll follow me anywhere. I tell you the truth, before the cock crows, you'll deny me thrice. So, and look, after the crucifixion, uh, you know, Peter rectified this, you know, Peter had a string of mistakes that he made, you know, he tried to tell Jesus not to go with the Pharisees, you know, he denied him three times, including to a young, young girl, I believe, who questioned his whereabouts with Jesus. So Peter had some, you know, missteps, you know, but that's just like us, I mean, Clearly, you know, so, uh, but bottom line, John's uh, gospel has an account of discipleship in chapter 15 that does not say to forsake everything you have. So here he's saying we should forsake everything we have. Well, what's forsake mean? It means to abandon. And then he's going to go on to define what it means in his opinion, which I disagree with. Uh, and if, if anyone agrees, please comment and let me know if maybe I missed something that is in the scripture somewhere that might support this. It doesn't mean impoverishing yourself and becoming a homeless beggar. It's about realizing that everything you own is from him 
and for his glory. So we should not pursue wealth and riches, but instead use everything he has given us to serve him. So I believe that we should use our spiritual gifts, uh, like how Paul talks about certain gifts in the body, some preachers, some teachers, some evangelists, some apostles. Um, and I do believe that there are different gifts in the body, even more than the ones that Paul just listed there. I think he gave a few examples to show you that the body has many members and with that many gifts of the members, right? And so, <clears throat> no, don't become a homeless beggar. I agree with him there. John had a house. Paul was a tent maker, right? I, I don't think he abandoned his trade to, you know, be an apostle of Christ. I don't think that's in the Bible. So I agree with him there. It doesn't mean you need to be a homeless beggar. But when the early apostles did travel before Paul's time, I believe they stayed with people, you know, they, their lodgings were people taking them in and giving them eat and drink as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, they didn't have much, you know, uh, Christ, when he said, come follow me, he meant drop what you're doing and come follow me. Like in a literal sense, I'll make you fishers of men. Right. Um, you know, just they were they were fishing, and Jesus comes and says, I'll make you fishers of men. So, you know, basically drop what you're doing. They literally drop what they're doing and they follow them. Um, you know, Jesus is not here in the flesh. How do we follow Jesus? Right? We follow Jesus by being born again and having his spirit abide in us. That's how we follow Jesus, right? Um, I can go into the synoptic gospels and pull out verses for this guy right here who made this comment and show him that you're not doing that and that you haven't forsaken, meaning abandoned everything you have. You got a house, you got a car, you have nice things. Maybe you have a family. Have you really abandoned everything you have? So he's saying to his audience here, we should forsake all that we have. Well, that's, see, that's confusing. You should, or you must. You know, because what he's saying is, yeah, you're saved by grace through faith, blah, blah, blah. You get your ticket to heaven. But you know what? If you want the rewards, and we're going to go over that in a minute, you got to do this, this, and this. You know, and I say no. I say this is a total heretical teaching right here. And the salvation that we have through Christ and the works that we do through, through Christ all come from within. They all come from the spirit. They all come from the gospel, the seed that is in us, the truth that we heard from the beginning. If we let that abide in us, we will abide with the son and the father. That's in first John, right? So, all right, let me stop going off here and I'll just keep reading. It's about realizing everything you own is from him for his glory. So we should not pursue wealth. Uh, Luke 14, 33 is the specific verse that I gave him. It doesn't mention wealth. I don't think even in the Versus before or after that. Um, if it does, I apologize, but it, it seems to be saying pretty plainly if you cannot forsake everything you have, you cannot be my disciple. That is the verse that we're discussing in Luke. Okay. So then he says, Paul said, We take no confidence in the flesh because I, I was telling him that when you say that we have to stop sinning to get rewards, because he's going to allude to that, I was telling him that that really just becomes you boasting in the flesh, right? If you can sin less than your brother and you expect a reward at the judgment seat for that, not only are you just claiming that you sin less than your brother because you still sin, right? But now you're boasting in the flesh because when you sin, you sin in the flesh, right? Paul said, there's nothing good that dwelleth in my flesh. So when we sin, we're clearly in the flesh when we sin, right? We're not in the spirit. The spirit cannot sin. I think we can collectively agree on that. So if you achieve something, it's profitable for your witness and for your personal life, sure. Uh, but if you think that you can put God in your debt by your disciplined behavior in the flesh, uh, I completely disagree with that. And I don't think there's a scripture to support that. That's why Paul said, we take no confidence in the flesh and we no longer know one another by the flesh, right? So he says here, and here comes the straw man. This is exactly what, for lack of a better term, the unsaved reprobates who don't believe the gospel say to me every time. Sin doesn't matter anymore. Make no effort to stop sinning. I never said any of these things. I submit to you, me and this guy probably sin the same amount. I mean, you know, this, this sins that we do that we, by omission, by thought, by deed, right? I'm not out there fornicating and, bopping people over the head with, with a hammer and 
I mean, <laughs> they all say this. It's the same. So what, do, so what do you mean? You can go out and just sin all you want? No, I never said that. What I'm saying, though, is that you don't defeat sin by fighting the flesh with the flesh. That's the only point I'm trying to make. Why does Paul say, shall, shall we sin? Because we are not under law, but under grace, God forbid, right? Of course, because he doesn't want you to turn the gospel of grace. Or actually, I say that Paul's being accused of turning the gospel of grace. So that's why he's saying, should we sin now that we're under grace, God forbid, right? Because that, that may come from the Judaizers accusing him of uh, giving people a license to sin by preaching grace, right? Uh, why does John say, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself as he is pure? Well, the verse is right there, so I don't need to go to it. Why does John say, and it starts here, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, comma, even as he is pure? That's actually a direct copy of the verse there. He's obviously talking about purifying ourselves of sin, really. So to the commenter here who wrote this comment, you think that that's what that says, that you need to purify yourself of sin. So Jesus didn't take away your sin. See, this is where this guy is in serious error. That grammatically doesn't even say that. In fact, I am going to pull it up, actually, because I, I want a little bit of better view of it. So let's go. What was that? First John 3, 3. Let's take a quick look at that just real fast, because this is insane right here. And this is taking a my, one of my favorite books, if not my favorite set of passages in the Bible that gives us peace with God, that lets us know where we stand with God, that we are eternally secure, and that if we remember the gospel every day of our lives and have that truth within us and present with us, and don't let the world overcome us, then we, we have that fellowship with the Father and the Son. Now, it says here, and every man that hath this hope in him purified. It says, it says just by having the hope, you, you purify yourself, even as he is pure. So for him to deduce that you have to stop sinning to purify yourself, first of all, he's never going to be as pure as he is pure, right? In the flesh. That is utterly ridiculous. You cannot enter into God's kingdom unless you are perfect and holy of the spirit. Why do you think our flesh is crucified with Christ? Our flesh is not going to enter into God's kingdom. Okay. He's not rightly dividing the word of truth here at all. He's confusing them. That's why he's trying to tell you that you have to purify yourself. What does Hebrews 10.10 10 say? And Hebrews 10.14, let's go to that. Let's see who does the purification. I would say that this is, it may not be using the word purification or, or purify, but this pretty much says how you're going to become perfect, right? So purifying yourself as he is pure. And he knows these verses. This is why he's without excuse, Okay. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Okay, so to the commenter, do you believe in pro progressive sanctification now? Do you believe that you have to sanctify yourself? Because that's where this is going in John uh, 1 John 3, 3, if you're saying that that's what that means, you're saying that you must be the one who perfects yourself. And, and you have to get as good as Jesus Christ, because it says, even as he is pure, okay? Who is he in that verse? It's Jesus. So you're going to perfect yourself in the flesh, even as he is pure. No, that can only happen to your spirit. So let's continue on, because I don't want to go rambling, okay? So I think we put that one to bed there. If we sin, we are taking away from our works for the beam of judgment. We are wasting time when we should be producing good works, and in instead we're spending it sinning, I think he meant to say. When Paul talks about the works-faith dichotomy, he's talking about salvation. We are saved by faith and not works, but the Christian life is one where we have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. He's saying this, is in, this in the letter to the Galatians. 
We aren't saved by works, as Galatians clearly teaches, but we are to walk in the spirit, not after the flesh. I agree that we should walk in the spirit, not after the flesh. I agree with that. Okay. But that's not talking about the Bema seed. He's taking Galatians here and using a verse in five, chapter five of Galatians to conflate it with the judgment seat of Christ. Well, let's take a quick look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. I think this will shed some light on it because this is talking about the Bema seed. And uh, it's more in context, in my opinion, than using Galatians 5.24. That Galatians 5.24, when Paul is exhorting us to walk after the spirit, not to fulfill the deeds of the flesh, right? Or the lust thereof. Because when you're in the spirit and you're in the fellowship with like-minded believers, are you in sin? You know, you're perfect, you know, and at that moment, but you, those moments aren't going to last, you know, 24 hours a day, right? So um, let's go to 10 here. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So here, here's where he's taking this, I believe, out of context. Where it says bad there at the end of the sentence, he's, he's going he's, he's gonna to have to tell you that that's your sin. But let's keep reading a little bit. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in, in your consciences. Okay? So let's go to 19. To wit, that God was in Christ recon reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So we have a right standing with God. And you can go to Romans 4 for this. You know, Romans 4 will tell you that you have imputed righteousness. And then it said, blessed is the man that God does not impute sin, where Paul quotes David in a psalm. So this guy believes that your sin still stands or it affects you, you know, he tried to say something a little bizarre here that you're going to spend so much time sinning that you won't be able to do any good works. I mean, really, that's, that's kind of silly. I've heard him say in his videos before, 100%, I've heard him say in his videos before that sinning will cause loss of reward at the judgment seat. Well, Jesus said that if you so much as look at a woman to lust at her, You've committed adultery in your heart. That is the stringency of the law, which this guy cannot see. He thinks that he can bring the law down to his level and achieve it in some sense and gain reward for that. Okay. Clearly, we shouldn't fornicate. Paul constantly warned of that, how you're making Christ, you know, one with a harlot when you do that, right? I highly advise that we don't do that. Never said that we should do that. However, there are other sins that you could commit, and he's going to have his audience believe that even in those sins, you know, we're losing rewards at the judgment seat. This is, this is crazy. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, walking in the flesh leads to chastening. 1 Corinthians 11.32, this chastening is to spur us to zealous, be zealous and repent. Revelation 3.19. Revelation 3.19 is talking about a church, okay? Okay, that's this is not corresponding with 1 Corinthians 11:32. It's just it's just the two times in the Bible, well it's also in Hebrews where chasing is mentioned, Hebrews uh 12, right? 12:6. 12, Walking in the flesh leads to chasing. First, let's go to 1 Corinthians 11:32. Let's take a look at what this says here. Because I I suspect that this this is talking about believers and this is this is people making the Lord's supper out to be like a drunken you know uh pig out let me let me see 11 whoops eleven thirty two. but there's verses that precede this verse you can't just look at eleven thirty two. let me see here so i noticed here too i was checking this out in 29 it says for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself so commenter what is damnation is damnation hell not discerning the Lord's body. So, you know, just like churches today, churches back then probably had unbelievers there. Does, does every church consist of believers who believe the gospel, the true gospel of grace? No, there's definitely unsaved people in the church. So do you also believe that, you know, you can be in this church and lose your salvation if you're a believer? 
because damnation to me sounds like someone who's on their way to hell. And then it'll continue and say, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. So he's trying to say, God's going to kill you if you keep sinning because of this verse. For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Yeah, judge to see if you're in the faith. Not all these people were clearly not in the faith. And, and it also says in the previous verses, there are many heresies among you. So there were wolves in this church. And I suspect that they were uh, unbelievers in this church. Because then finally it'll say here in 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened, chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. So he's going he's gonna to take Revelation 3, where it's talking about a church, and it's clearly referring to believers because Christ says, everyone that I love, I rebuke and chasten, okay? And this is not the same church. It's the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3. Okay, 19, this is not the same church. This is not the same set of passages or context at all. To conflate those is to confuse people and yourself, really. Um, so in, in 32, Paul's just giving a general message here. When we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned. In fact, reading this now, this is not even talking about... Um, this doesn't necessarily have to be talking to about, about the ones that Paul mentions that are asleep, meaning dead, right? Who were weak. You know, uh, I believe when he talks about them, clearly they weren't taking care of themselves, right? Uh, you know, these could have been serious drunkards, people that just destroyed themselves physically and passed away. Um, but he does make mention for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily. So these people didn't recognize the body of Christ. They didn't recognize salvation. I mean, uh, damnation here in this context, this is not discerning the Lord's body. You know, these are people that didn't believe. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no proof text here that says that these are believers that God got so angry with about their sin that he punished them with death. You know, I think that's a heretical teaching. Let me ask you this. Do you know of any Christians that were believers and they were sinning egregiously and they just dropped dead on the spot and you think God destroyed them with death. Let me know, honestly, if you know of anyone like that in your church or otherwise, because you're just reading a scripture and trying to use it to tell people, if you don't do this, this is going to happen. So now let's, let's show the verses that clearly conflict with this guy's comments and his messages. Okay. If you think that you can sin to the point where God's going to destroy you, okay, then you are not loved as the son is loved. You are not perfected in love because perfect love casts out fear because fear is of torment. So, you know, you may say that, oh, well, that's only hell. I remember he had commented to me that he has peace with the Lord. Uh, I'm sorry, peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ because he's not going to hell. So that's the only reason why you have peace with the Lord Jesus Christ. So you don't have an everlasting peace knowing that there's nothing that can separate you from God's love. No created thing, nothing high, nothing low, right? No powers, right? That can separate you from God's love. That's, you don't have that kind of peace. You just have the peace that tells you, well, I'm not going to hell. That's your Christian life. You're, that's the peace that you have. Everything else in between that you have to earn with good works and good behavior, then you don't believe. I'm not saying you don't believe the gospel, but there's a lot of scriptures that you don't believe. And I'm going to give you one right now, okay? Because I'm sick of this garbage that people teach that God's angry with you, and He's gonna He's gonna take you home early. You know what 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 are you doing that you think He's gonna take you home early? If, if you could take yourself home early. If you're sinning that badly, you can get yourself killed. You know, if you're screwing around and uh, doing drugs and or you're fornicating to the point where you're you get involved in a marriage and the spouse comes to get you and, and, and kills you, that happens all the time. I mean, these are different. And you could say that's God's judgment. That's fair. But the way this guy is couching it is that it's sin in general. He's not talking about people that do things that are you know, you have like a one in a million chance of being killed by someone else's spouse for cheat for cheating with their, you know, for 
stepping out with a guy's wife. Like that's not your average every day. Let's talk about things that we deal with in our average everyday Christian life. That was the context of this debate, not things that have like a one millionth of a percent chance of happening to you, right? So, okay. Commenter, your commenter, do you believe this? Because he says we got to get to work, right? For our reward. Meanwhile, Paul said, he who works is reckoned of debt, right? I'm going to go to that in a minute. But first, let me ask you this. What do these verses mean to you? Okay. If you're saying that if we don't do X, Y, and Z, God's going to take us home early. He's going to be angry with us, displeased with us. He's going to continually chasten us, even though you can't provide any examples except a couple of verses in the Bible that are not pertaining to your everyday Christian life. Okay. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy late, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay? When this guy tells people they need to obey Luke 14.33 and forsake all that they have, and that's what they should be doing, he can't also say in the same sentence, or I'm sorry, in the same breath that, his yoke is now easy and his burden is light, right? He has to contradict what Jesus said. He has to make his life difficult if he's going to follow the, the way of uh, literally following Jesus as in the synoptic gospels, like in Luke. And I believe the account is similar of this in Matthew. Um, well, this is, we're in Matthew right now. I'm actually not 100% sure off the top of my head the account about following him. If any man follow him, he should take up his cross daily and deny himself, right? So you have to think of the context of this and that Jesus is speaking directly to people. He's telling them that if you want to follow me, this is what it's going to take. It's almost as if he's saying, look, if you're not ready for this, don't, don't even do it. He's not saying, you know, if you don't do this, you're going to hell. Clearly, I think we all believe that. But he's talking about people who are following him in person at that time. And if anyone has any different thoughts on this, please let me know. But it seems clear to me that discipleship before Christ went to the cross, before he was resurrected, is different than it is in John, which is a picture of discipleship after the cross where he doesn't say things like you must forsake all you have. He talks about bearing fruit unto God and that apart from him, you can do nothing. Okay. Uh, no, not forsaking all you have. So I believe that John was written to those who might believe. And that if you want someone to come into the knowledge of the truth, who hasn't believed, you can start with John chapter three, but as you keep reading, you'll find the Christian life in there you'll find how one lives and fellowships with God and the son and how they can achieve those things and how they can have that peace. So if he's saying that you must forsake all you have uh, to earn reward and to be in good favor with God, then he also cannot enjoy the peace and the easy yoke and the light burden that Christ is promising you because those two conflict, okay? I've heard him say, discipleship is hard. I mean, if I don't have to ask him live right now to miss, you know, I don't want to misrepresent him and, and try to think for him during this video, but if you're saying that you must forsake all you have daily or whatever he's trying to say you must do, stop, you know, make sure you repent of all your sin. He was talking about that. Don't have unrepentant sin. Basically, he's saying that you saved by faith through grace, but now you better get into lordship salvation for your Christian life because that's exactly what that is. Um, and let's go to let's go to another verse here where he's going to contradict Jesus with his teachings. Oh, whoops. I'm sorry, John. Let's go to John 14. And there's so many verses. There really are. I'm not going to continue going on with this, but I just want to show a couple of important ones that seem to very adroitly point out how this guy is completely and totally uh, confused about what's going on. And I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to say that because we started out getting along real well until 
I realized that he believes the gospel, but then you got to turn to lordship salvation for your Christian walk. So Jesus says here, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Okay? So if I think that Christ is going to take me early for, for whatever sins, I don't even know what sins this guy's talking about. He didn't make that clear. And he also says, you know, we need to do good works and make sure we're not sinning. So we're doing a lot of good works. I mean, what are you saying, man? What works are you talking about? Do you even know? Why don't you list some of them and say what we should be doing, man? So we know, so we don't get killed early by God. I mean, what you're saying is confusing. That's all it is. It's confusion. Okay. You need to get to work and stop sinning. You sound just like these unsaved bastards out there. I have to say, I'm sorry, but as, as I think more about this, I realize, I realize how heretical in nature it is and how similar it sounds to all the people that accuse us all day that we're lazy Christians and we don't work and we don't feed the poor enough. We don't do this and we don't do that. So we're really not saved. It sounds just like their line of, you know what? Okay. We have peace with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through him. Okay. We are loved as the son is loved. That's in John 17, 23. Let's look at that one. That's another important one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So the father loves us as he loves the son with a perfect eternal love. He gives us a perfect eternal peace with God through him. And you're going to say that God's looking at us like we're not doing enough and we need to get busy doing this, that, and the third, which no one ever seems to, you know, um, propose as these good works that you should specifically be doing. Give me a list. Break it down for me. What should I be doing every day that, uh, so I can make God happy with me so I don't displease him? And, you know, and he chastens me in, in a bad way with, with punishment. Uh, and, and he did say, in his defense, he did say that not all the chastening is bad and that not all of it is to harm you or hurt you, which I agree with him on. But if we go back to the message, you can clearly see some of these things that he said here are totally heretical and taken completely. I mean, this where he says about 1 John 3, 3, that we must purify ourselves even as he is pure. That blew my mind. Okay, Paul, or I'm sorry, John is saying that just that hope, the hope of being glorified, the hope of glory is what purifies us, not us purifying ourselves of sin. Okay, that one blew me away that he actually thought that that meant that you need to clean up your life to please the Lord. That's, that's really at the end of the day what this guy's message is, is that you must be pleasing to the Lord to earn a reward. And real quick, I want to close with Romans. Okay. Romans chapter four. Okay. In verse three, for what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So what this guy is teaching you is that you got to stop sinning to make sure that you're going to do well at the Bema seat. Even that in itself, you know, you're not going to go to hell or anything like that, you know, but you're going to get you're going to suffer loss at the judgment seat because of your sin. When sin is not mentioned once in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where the judgment seat is mentioned, and 2 Corinthians 5, it says the opposite. It says that your sins, will, your trespasses will not be imputed to you. This guy has a, a secondary use for the law, right? Oh, I got to finish reading the comment. Sorry. Let's go back to the comment because this whole thing started with me talking about the functionality of the law and how we're not subject to the law. You know, Paul made it very abundant and clear. We have no relationship to the law. He said, where the law is there, 
uh, where the law is, there is wrath, or the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is the position that you're in right now. You're not under law. That's why your sin can't be imputed to you. What do you not understand about that? If your sin can be imputed to you in any way, it's all or nothing with the law. You don't get to have a secondary use for the law. That's what Calvinists teach, by the way, that the law is used for your Christian life. So he says here at the end, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, Romans 10, 4, because I propose that verse to him as one of the many uh, that shows how we're not under the law and how we have no relation to, uh, relationship to it whatsoever, Romans 7, 4. Uh, he is the tiak of the law. Its goal, its purpose is reason for existing. That's why he fulfills the law, okay? Now we are dead to it because we live in him, but that doesn't mean we throw it in the garbage. Well, how can we throw it in the garbage? The law still exists because there are still people that don't believe and they will be judged by the books. It says in Revelation 21, I believe, uh, that we will be, that, you know, he opened the books, the, the, the dead came up from the sea, right? Uh, and he opened the books and the, there was the book of life, I believe he mentions. And then he opens other books. And those, I believe, are the books of the Torah where the law is. Okay, and you, and you have the law that the unsaved will be judged by. The unsaved will be judged by that law because they are under it, right? The law was written to those that are under the law. You are not under the law. The law was never even given to you, man. Are you a Jew? The law was given to the Jews. So if you refer to the law for your Christian life, you're in error. That, that's a fact. You are not to refer to the law for your Christian life. Okay, Paul said that you'd be committing spiritual adultery if you did that, right? That's why he used that euphemism of a marriage in Romans 7, 3 to compare it. Say you're now married to another in Christ. He says, a woman uh, who's married to a man, uh, if he's still alive, even though she divorces him, she's considered an adulterer if he's not dead. So the husband that she was once married to has to die for her to freely marry again. So you have to die to the law. It has to be non-existent to you. Otherwise, you can't bear fruit unto God. So all the works that you think you're doing by fighting your flesh every day and denying yourself and all this. And, and, and he's clearly taking denying yourself out of context. I mean, even in the scriptures, denying yourself could be seen as relenting to your own strength. It is not I, but Christ in me, right? That's the Christian life. Galatians 2.20 says, I live yet not I, but Christ in me. So fighting your flesh every day is not bearing fruits of the spirit, my friend. I got news for you. If that's what you think you should be doing, then you're doing exactly what all the heretics on YouTube, Melissa Doherty, John Piper, uh, John MacArthur, surrender your life to Christ. You're teaching that now? That's lordship salvation, that you have to give your life over to Christ. You're basically saying that. And you teach against it, which is mind-blowing to me. You're saying we should, you opened up the, the letter with you, we should forsake all we have. That is lordship salvation. Giving your life up for Christ. It's the same thing. It's just worded a little bit differently. So you're essentially saying that we get saved by grace through faith. Bam, we punched our ticket to heaven. Now we should listen to John MacArthur for our life. And he's probably going to get mad at this. It's, it's, it's a bit overdone, I admit. But when you, when you say things like that, it does line perfectly up with their teachings, okay? Where's your rest? Where's your rest? Are you resting in the Lord? Or are you getting busy trying to create works that you think are pleasing to God? Let's look at one last verse and then I'll close. I know this is long, man. I know it. Just hang in there with me. There's a message in here somewhere, I promise you. Um, okay, Hebrews, what am I doing? I know where Hebrews is. All right, let's go to this. I mean, commenter, what do you make of this verse here? How do you, how do you juxtapose this verse with your teachings? Okay, I believe it's 15. 
Okay, I got to look it up real quick. Sorry, guys. Uh, labor to enter into his rest is the verse I'm looking for. Uh, Hebrews 4.11. Okay, sorry. All right, back. Let's resume. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Okay. And there's another verse that says, ah, I'm sorry, it was 10 the whole time. Let's read that in the full context. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. That's a powerful verse right there. Okay. You know, we're being asked here to enter into his rest. Remember Matthew 11? Uh, come, to me, come to me, all you heavy laden, and I will give rest for your weary souls, for my burden is easy and my yoke, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, it sounds a lot like this verse. So the works that we produce in the spirit are by abiding in the vine, which doesn't take effort. And that's where I want to close with this. You know, I believe this guy's saved. I don't believe he's unsaved in any way. I've seen him give the gospel. I just think that teaching this about the Christian life, this sort of lordship, salvation, Christian life type belief is wood, hay, and stubble. And that if you've been building on this for years and you continue to build on this, you, you will suffer loss. You will suffer loss. And, I, you know, I think that's important to you that at least you, you give it a, a opportunity, you give yourself an opportunity to find out what the works of God really are. And I'm not saying that I know that unequivocally. I, I'm new at this. I admit that I'm still searching myself to find what those works are. Okay. But I don't feel a burden on me to do it because I want to let God work in me. Okay. He is the one who works in me, not me working in me. Okay. And if you're preaching, that we got to get to work and we got to continually deny ourselves everything. So if I go and play golf this Sunday, I'm not denying myself according to him. He might even say, I'm not going to go as far as to say he's saying that's a sin, but he's, he's clearly making it sound as if, well, you should be doing something else that day. You know, maybe you should spend the day at the soup kitchen instead. That would be pleasing to the Lord. And he will be, you know, uh, ready to reward you at the judgment seat because you denied yourself playing a round of golf on Sunday or whatever it might be. Uh, and yeah, so I just want to close with um, a prayer for you guys. Heavenly Father, I pray for all the saints who are in Christ Jesus, that they may be edified by this video, that they might find peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ if they don't believe yet. And if you're out there and you haven't believed yet, the gospel is this simple. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he came into the world, and that he died for our sins, and that he was risen again on the third day for our justification, and that through him you might have life. He is the eternal son of God. He is God. And if you believe this with your whole heart, you are saved and nothing can take that from you. And this is the most beautiful message in the Bible. If you haven't read the Bible yet, go to John, start with John chapter one and read to John chapter three. If you're not a big reader, if I give any unbeliever three chapters in the Bible to read, it's John one through three. Okay. And you will find who Jesus Christ is and you will find the gospel in there and you don't have to believe it the second you read it but read it and let it resonate 
meditate on it. Let it let it sit in your mind. Okay, and the Father will draw you. Okay, and you'll find that truth in there. And so, uh, God bless you. Take care. I'm going to stop my video here, and you're going to see me for a second because I don't edit much.